Okay, Chad is going to be talking about Mojo and uh, programming in uh, C for uh, Linux and heavy on the latter, light on the, the former, if I remember his uh, messages uh, correctly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh dear, we need feedback. I'm gonna take the earphones out for right now. Um, <laughs> so, over the course of this year, Christian Leitner, who's behind the LLVM project from way back in the day, who was then at Apple, then at Google, then at Tesla, and then in a couple of risk five startups, uh, went back and is now doing uh, his own programming language using all of the new LVM uh, technologies to try to make programming for devices like GPUs, massively multi-core processors a lot easier. Um, so, so what he's come out with is it's called the Mojo programming language. And it's mostly, um, it's a lot like Python, at least in one of the syntaxes that it has. And it actually spawns a full Python virtual machine if you ask it to. Uh, and this is probably a smart move on his point because you can do all your uh, input and output in regular Python and then pass all of your matrices over to the high performance computing kernels that he's trying to make. And you won't have to change any anything in your in your pipeline, just regular Python code works. Um, and right now it has support uh, for AMD 64, ARM 64. So your, your Intel and uh, basically just the MacBook and uh, Amazon's ARM chips. I, I don't know if he's really got into the other ones out there. And supposedly in first quarter of next year, he's gonna be rolling out support for NVIDIA GPUs. So it's not quite a, a production ready language right now for anything that's GPU. But if you have a CPU code like at the FEMPEG or something like that, you, you can probably see some wins by using this. Um, I see the mouse. Yes, you got a mouse. Uh, so part of it uh, is he has a just in time compiler based off of LLVM's ORC, which I'll go to the website here, which is a uh, like, again, if you're familiar with the Java virtual machine, it's a JIT for LLVM languages. And what this allows him to do is to do some runtime profiling of code to kind of understand what's going on. And so that you can take variables that are like constants and uh, take those out of like the function definitions and make do a lot of optimizations like that on the fly. And also you can do some runtime hot code swapping. And nobody understands exactly how he's doing this because this part is open source yet, but it should be sometime this year. So I get a chat message. Pizza, okay. Um, the second thing that this is using is called uh, multi-level intermediate representation, which is the same as uh, LLVM's uh, existing representation, but it's a little bit more abstract. It's like a superset of that. Let me see if I can find a slide here that kind of shows you what it looks like. It uses that same uh, single static assignment uh, representation. Let's pull out a slide here. Do, 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 do. So yeah, it's gonna take your LLVM AIR, which already exists for CPU, and it's going to be generating a bunch more for all your special GPUs, and it's going to mesh it all together in one super dialect and then uh, optimize it, which is nice because you can fold a lot of things with the LLVM optimizers, and you're going to get a lot of performance but without rewriting a bunch of compiler stuff. Um, sorry, I'm looking. OK, this is what a single static assignment looks like. So every variable you write to is brand new, hasn't been touched. And so what it allows you to do uh, by always saving to a new variable instead of overwriting the same variable is it allows the optimizer to be a lot more simplified because you never have to worry that like, like 
for set 17, it's brand new. Nobody's touched with it. Nobody's ever going to write to it again. As soon as I write to it, it's it's uh, going to be static, which allows you to do a bunch of really nice compiler tricks. But basically the same as LVM IR, except a little bit more generic and high level in, in what it can do. Um, but yeah, single static assignments, basically every variable you only write to it once, and it never changes. It's immutable. And that allows for some easy optimization passes. Uh, so it has some SIMD capabilities uh, for single instruction, multiple data, like your ABS 512. And here's some demo code that he has for a uh, an n-body simulation. And here he has a struct. So it, it's kind of like C where it has structs. And he has this uh, SIMD type uh, that's a floating point a uh, 64 point the floating point value of four elements. And so that's what a SIMD type looks like in, in Mojo. Um, and you can give it some of these annotations, like register passable trivial means that uh, I can pass this around within registers on the CPU. I don't necessarily have to write this thing in memory all the time. And so you can do some extra optimizations by, like if you have like an ARM, ARM64 processor, you can use all of its you know, 32 or whatever registers to, to cache a lot of these values. Whereas you, you couldn't do that on a, a machine that you had to read and write this to memory every time. So that's, that's kind of what the structs look like. Um, so in C, you'd have something called type def. Here it has something called alias to, to, to make constants, like all your numeric stuff. Um, the import syntax is a lot like Python's for importing uh, your different modules. Uh, for comments, it, it uses the Python style comment of the pound sign. Um, which I, is that also the badge comment? I always forget it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's also the same as badge comments. Um, let's see here. So oh, it has a special annotation for loop unrolling. Uh, so it'll take this out and actually write uh, it embodies times. And so that'll just automatically do that. Um, this is what a function definition looks if you're using the, and it, it has one syntax that looks kind of like Rust and one syntax that looks kind of like Python. But if you're using the Rust, the Rust, the Rust-like function syntax, it's like this, where it works function, and then you get your function name, which in this case is offset momentum. And I think he's trying to follow what the Python, uh, what do they call them? Types. Type decorators or whatever yeah. syntax. Uh, so in out means that uh, this variable uh, can be both written and how would I explain this? Um, basically mutable. It's mutable. It, it, you're both can, it can both comes in and out of this function. Um, bodies is what this variable is named, and it's a, of type static tuple and bodies planet. So it's a tuple of n bodies in this planet, which I think is a struct up here. Yeah, that's this planet struct, where it has a position vector, a velocity vector, a, a mass vector, depending if it's you know, Jupiter or Mars or whatever. And it looks like you set up some sort of planet simulation with the n-body calculation. Um, it's basically just a glorified pointer, because it's, it, it's uh, basically a glorified pointer. You can uh, write to and from it. You can read it, you can write it. I, with the the pointerness being hidden, I, I think I think the way that this works is that if you don't put in in, in out, it doesn't it, it doesn't allow it to be mutable or whatever. Yeah, but it's kind of like Rust, like everything is constant unless you can tell otherwise. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, and it actually has two different things. It has bars, which are uh, variables you can. Uh, Write to over and over again, and vowels, which are constants. Gotcha. And and because and when the compiler knows something that's a constant, it can really speed up the compiler. And you have to remember that Chris Latner isn't a language designer; he's a compiler designer. So, so this this language is just basically designed to play nice with the compiler, which is what's next? He has some like Swift now. He's with awful people on Swift as well. 
So you brush on Swift. So this is your second time around. Yes. Well, I see some Swift. There's a Swift is a little less too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me go actually run this code. I'm going to pop up my editor. Yeah, you can see that. And I'm actually, this is a little bit bigger. Um, so, by the way, it even has a man page. Fancy. Uh, and this actually comes out of a package manager that Modular has, which I won't get into here, but ping me offline if you need help setting it up. Um, so if I do mojo build, what was that? Uh, we just looked at the uh, end body. What? It's not here? Yeah, and anybody that mojo's there. Oh, did I hack off the end? No, sorry, I hacked off the end. That's what happens when my terminal windows to be. Um, so that builds it. And if I do a mojo dash dash help, um, here's all of the commands it currently supports. Uh, it has a built-in debugger, uh, which will fire up uh, your LDB. And he's trying to, I think, reuse like the C debugging syntax. And so it, it kind of barfs, it sometimes does it. And it is a real hack for both <laughs> L files in, what is it, the Mako that this is on a Mac. Um, this is a BSD Unix. Um, so yeah, he's, he's really messing around with how these things work. But if you want debug symbols, I think it's mojo build. Yeah, here's the build commands. Uh, you can set the number of uh, CPUs. So if I only want this to use two CPUs, it'll tell it that. Um, if you want to turn off optimization, that's useful. Uh, but the one that I was actually looking for here is to, to, to do debug mode. You want to set the debug level high if you're going to be uh, actually trying to program on a day-to-day -day basis. But that, that's useful because then LLDB can actually see what's going on. You can set breakpoints and stuff. And then it also has a, a memory sanitizer built in, which is nice. So you can do a, I mean, just the ant, he has the address sanitizer for LVM built in and the thread sanitizer. So it, it'll, it'll barf if you use a, uh, thread and address stuff that's not there. Um, okay. So what is it? Mojo build nbody.mojo. And then that makes a mojo dot, actually just a dot nbody. So we start with the energy system of negative 0169. And conservation of mass and energy, we should have the same energy when we get done with the end body simulation. It looks like it only shaved off a couple bits. So it's not a perfect simulation, but the simulation preserved energy. So we'll obey we the second law of thermodynamics with our simulation. I think that's the second law. I, don't know, I forget. Anyway, we have conservation of energy in the simulation. And if you go and look at the code, it probably has all your fancy physics equations for gravity and whatnot for time step. But okay. After, after physics class, you probably you say what? Uh, you want to go remember all your pain in physics. <laughs> yeah. Or, or I don't. I don't even see how many. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that runs multiple CPUs the way that he has the code. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the second thing that's useful for this language is he has a built-in auto-tune. And right now, uh, for developers, I think the biggest two wins for this are buffer sizes, because you can tune your buffer size to the architecture, um, and also the way that he's using it here. So uh, this is a mem set. So in your, your C standard library, you have a Sorry. There. This is the this is the BSD Unix man page, but it's going to be about the same for Linux. It's a it's a C command where you give it a buffer uh, and some value and a size, and it sets everything to that value, uh, which is useful because you can zero out 
buffers to make them all zero. Or whatever. I guess, yes, strings. Um, and so we get back to here. The thing is with memset is if you're sending a very small section of memory, you want to use a, just a, a stupid assembler loop. And if you're using like a very big section of memory, you usually want to build, use the built-in memset that's in the standard library that I just showed you. Because the one in the C standard library theoretically has probably been tuned to your operating system. So it knows what the, uh, the operating system's page sizes are and buffer sizes. So as you get to the larger chunks of memory, it will be able to use fancy SIMD instructions behind the hood and, and have those tuned, theoretically. And so in this memset.mojo that he has, which the GitHub version is going to look better. Actually, GitHub does not yet have syntax highlighting. I, I bet that's to come. Um, what was I going to show you? Yeah, two. Auto? There we go, auto two. That's what I was looking for. So here he has a bunch of different uh, offsets at which you should switch from like the uh, the algorithm that just does it in assembler versus the algorithm that does it as more of like a um, like using the system mem copy. And here it's iterating over uh, 0, 4, 8, 16, and 32. I believe these are bytes. I'm not quite sure. I'd, I'd have to look at the code. But uh, basically, it's going to run an experiment here, and it's going to pick up uh, using that just-in-time work thing, uh, which one's fastest. And then it's going to be using that in the production loop later in your code. And it does this by setting up just what the main program looks like. So just like a C, where you have a main function, a Mojo has a main function. Right now, there's a special decorator that you have to add to this, which I'll probably remember later. But basically, oh, it's throwable. If you're using any I.O. functions in here, you have to tell it that it's throwable because the uh, the standard I.O. functions in the Mojo standard library throw an error, uh, like if your file open doesn't work. And so if you're using any file operations, you now have to make main throwable, which it's not by default. Um, yeah. I'm saying that thing has to throw all the way up to actually give some what? And then throw all the way up, right? So if you have some function, you've got to throw up your entire file stack. Yeah. And there's a there's a way in C++ to turn this off. I forget what it is. But there's a way to turn off the, uh, the throwable stuff, which can make your code a little bit faster. Assuming it's not going to throw anything in part. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's just uh, running the different benchmarks here where he has a, a, a version one and a version two. And it, it comes out with a version that happens to be best for what, which, which offset you should uh, um, go from the assembler version to the, uh, the operating system version. Did I not build that? There we go. And so this is, I think the stars represent the runtime of the various uh, of the various choices in algorithm for each of these algorithms that it's trying. And I forgot to look in the code to see if he has like, I think it's just using like a random number generator to come up with what actually goes into these. Anyway, well, what it did was it uh, it tuned it. So it came up with like an optimal mem set for that data pattern on this CPU, which is faster than the system version, which is really jittery for some reason. And I'd actually have to go in and look in that. But that's kind of how auto-tune works. And, and what auto-tune is going to be best is if you have a buffer that's like, you know, 20, 48 bits or, you know, 4,000 bytes or whatever. Um, It'll have to tune those to make sure that your cache lines and your OS pages 
all match up to the, the best for your code. And that's probably, that's probably the most useful for, you, for that. Um, the other thing I was going to show you that it does. Ah, that was, that was the end of the. Uh, um, well, I had a Jupyter notebook. Okay, let me just clear all the outputs. <clears throat> Get this off. There we go. Uh, so yeah, Bojo, it's, but eventually it's, it's going to replace CUDA because you're going to be able to write everything in Mojo and it's going to automatically translate it to your GPU. Somebody said something about, what's that? It just came out. C++ durable. Yeah, if you look at Daniel Lemier has a couple uh, benchmarks on how to get rid of that for C++ that speeds it up. I, I'm, I'm forgetting it off the top of my head. Um, so this is a, this is a straight up Jupyter notebook with a, what is it? Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not actually going to be running Mojo in the Jupyter notebook, but there is a Jupyter, I'm sorry, a, a, a Mojo VS Code thing you can download that has a special Mojo build of Jupyter. Hmm. So you can interact with your Python really easily in, in Jupyter. I'm only going to be using command line Mojo. But. Uh, so this is a, a I, I, I learned some uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook stuff. Apparently, if you do uh, dollar sign, dollar sign file, you can write files from a Jupyter Notebook. So I'm writing the C program to this uh, hello.c file. And it's just a standard C program. You include your uh, stdio, which gives you all your operating system calls to read and write to, to files and stuff. And it has a, a main function. And it calls the stdio printf function hello world. Um, and C, if you want a new line, you have to add a new line character on the end. And all Unix programs, uh, both for BSD and Linux, they, they have a return <clears throat> error. And if it's zero, that usually means my program doesn't have an error. And if it returns something that's not zero, it's usually an error code. And so you can go back and look at it and see why, why did this, what was the error code? Uh, but, but usually it'll return zero, and so this is a C program. And also, I didn't know this, but you can call batch from inside of a Jupyter Notebook if you do dollar sign, or sorry, percent percent batch. And so I'm using the, uh, the good news of the C compiler, which is actually an alias on MacBooks to be a, uh, the LVM compiler. Um, and then it's saying output uh, to an executable called hello, this uh, hello.c. And I also didn't know when I was writing this talk that uh, Mac OS comes with its own version of Battlefront called Leaks. I did not know this existed. So if I then uh, execute my hello executable through this Leaks program that will act like Valgrind and tell me if I have any memory leaks, which is it's cool. I didn't know that there was a Valgrind alternative for BS Unix. Um, and then I'm going to pass it through Clang format, and it's going to take my shittily formatted uh, C program and make it fancy formatted. So let's run this. So it outputs hello world, just like you expected. Um, uh, and then this leaks program, it tells me this is the, the path that I executed it from. A bunch of crap we probably don't care about, but the good thing is that it has no memory leaks, which it shouldn't, because we haven't allocated the memory that we haven't messed with. So, OK. If you didn't get a leak, you probably found a bug. Yeah, in, you get, in Hello World, you got problems. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just going to load this hello.c file. And you'll notice, I'll oh, ignore that trash down at the end. It actually formatted it. it took my shittily formatted no indentations and added in all the indentations for me. So the, the client format worked. Yay. Yeah. Now we're going to do the same with Mojo. So we're going to do a write file hello.mojo, and it's going to print. And this is what gets me, is the print function doesn't throw. I, I, I don't think Chris has later really thought through his API for, for what's throwable in me, because I don't know, does print after the return error code? I'm going to have to look at this. 
I, I'm not curious. Uh, sure. Okay, because if you closed it, 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 it okay. Because you closed it into that one. So actually, when you do that in all ways, you can do it. You can't not return an error code, can you? It just defaults to zero if there's none. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I believe so. Easy aside. I was not going to go with that. Uh, okay. So write file hello.mojo, it writes it. And because Mojo is like Python, indentation matters. And so it's nice because it's readable. It's bad because if your spaces are off, you're going to be screwed. Mm -hmm. so, so make sure in your editor, you set tabs to be spaces. Yeah. You're also going to have a bad day. Because you don't want to mix tabs and spaces in Python. It, 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 I mixed up with it a couple times, and the yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little entertaining. Large enough, yeah, it's yeah. If you're writing Mojo, turn on make, make tabs and make more spaces, or else you're gonna hate yourself. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna load up a bash shell. Uh, it's gonna do Mojo build. Uh, hello dot Mojo. It's gonna output it as hello Mojo, which is that that's when it's actually it's gonna be. Anyway. And then it's going to run that same leaks program, just like Valgrind, to see if it uh, if it has any memory leaks. And it looks like it has no memory leaks. Yay! Um, and here's a, a little bit more contrived Mojo program that has the holy trinity of Unix I/O. So in, in a Unix program, you have uh, all of these stuff that you give it on the command line. So like man printf, um, it's going to spit out, uh, printf is a command that this would be the, arg the first argument to the man command. So it's going to have command line arguments. It's going to have, uh, I want to type env, but I don't know if I have anything in there that should be secret. I can't do that. But anyway, it, you have your environment variables, which is another way that you, because I can do like, who equals something. And then I can do my program, whatever. And it will pick up that two environment variable. And so the second thing you have in, in Unix is environment variables. And the third thing is file in it. And so it's going to <clears throat> import the argv, which is the command line argument module. It's going to import the get env, which gets all your shell variables. And it's going to, um, yeah, sorry. So yeah, this is what I was telling you. Because it's doing some file AO, you have to get that raises uh, thing, or else it's going to throw an exception on you. Um, it's going to print the length of the arguments that were set to it on the command line. Uh, for every argument, uh, in this uh, uh, command, it's going to print all the arguments that came to the program. And then it's going to open up uh, slash dev slash st stdin, standard in. So in, this is a POSIX thing, so this is in, in BSD Unix, but it's going to be the same in Unix. Uh, usually, if, if you do like a printf, it automatically goes to slash dev slash std out. And if you do a, a what's the opposite of print app? It's uh, print. That gets. I'm forgetting now. Yeah, gets, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it automatically reads this dev slash stdin file that the show has available to it. So, 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 so you don't actually need to have like stdin as part of your language. You can just uh, open it as any other file. Mm -hmm. um, which is, is useful for a lot of stuff that is treated as a file. Okay. Um, and it's going to read three bytes, and then it's going to read 200 bytes. And then it's going to print uh, uh, what was in the first one, and it's going to print this, It's going to print what the ASCII value of the letter I is, and then it's going to print out the second blob, and then it's going to print out the environment variable uh, for home. And so I'm going to write that file. Okay. And now we're actually going to execute it. And it's going to uh, um, give it input for Mojo. 
and it's going to pipe that to its uh, stator den. So that, that way it has something to read from that file. And before I do that, I'm first going to do that. Actually, I'll do that later. I'll, I'll, I'll move the raises later to show you what error it gives. And so I output this, and it outputs the two arguments uh, from here, which is some arguments, because I gave it some arguments. And everything here is mostly a tensor type, they call it, for all its arrays. So all of its like n-dimensional matrix types, it calls tensors. And it has 73, uh, 110, uh, 112. Uh, for the first three bytes that I got. Then 73, which I had an output, is the letter I, which is the first letter of the input that I gave it. So that's correct. It, it, just, it just output uh, I and P, basically. Those that has to be values for I, capital I, lowercase n, lowercase p. And then it output all the rest of the string as, a, as, a, as an array. So you got, you got the first three characters, and if I count here, there should be 12 more characters. And I'm assuming the last one is the null character, ASCII 10. Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to re-look at it. And, and int 8 means there are 8-bit eight, eight, eight values that it's reading. ASCII 10? Yeah, I think it's null. That's uh, a lot. It's what? Blind feed. Blind feed. Blind feed. OK. Oh, blind feed. Whatever. Um, Oh, zero, zero. Wait, are you talking? Are you talking ten decimal or ten hex? Ten, ten ASCII decimal. Oh, okay. I was thinking hex one zero. No, no. These are these are ASCII decimal. Okay, yeah, zero eight. No. And so with that with that little program, you can now do all of your uh, Unix file layout that you'll ever need to do. So you now know how to program Mojo. Yeah, can I still? This is at least up the file layout. Okay. This is the right. say what? I assume this is because oh, what were you saying that? before? This is because uh Jupyter doesn't know Mojo. Yes, correct. Yeah, this is just a this is a Jupyter notebook. I right? I'm just I'm just running like Jupyter things. It's, it's, it's showing up to a bash shell here. Yeah, because if you notice he's using uh I'm using the magic character to show up. You just dump to a file and then. Yeah, yeah. This, 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 this yeah. notebook knows nothing about Mojo the way that it's set up. There is a Mojo Jupyter, but I, it's probably flaky as hell because it's still in beta. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can do your, your holy trinity of, of Unix IO in, uh, in Mojo. And the other one. Well, first, let me get rid of this raises here to show you what that does. So it should bark on us, telling us that main can't raise. Yeah, the, the, yeah. So main by, by itself doesn't have the raise, so you have to add that. But these, these are what Mojo errors look like. That back in. Let's see here. Raise, 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 raise. What? Oh, I screwed something up here. Oh, raises. Thank you. There. Okay. It's raises, I bet. And the other thing I want to show you is how to uh, fire up uh, Python from inside Mojo. Because for most of your sanity right now, until they get the standard, uh, the standard library working, you're going to want to use the Python. Uh, here, simple interrupt at Py. Yeah, this, is, this is an examples folder of, of the Mojo GitHub. This is not what I was looking for. This is the hell of an wrong dot mojo. Sorry. 
I thought it was simple interop. Maybe I'm just not reading it correctly. Uh, so it installs NumPy, I guess it's got check mod. Hello from Python, blah, blah, blah. Is Mojo calling this file one? Oh, it's a, it's a file that Mojo calls, my bad. Is it check bar? I saw there's a, a Mojo file called just simple interop, or something like that. Oh, hello interop, that was the one I was looking for, my bad. So this is how you get it to talk to Python. Uh, so you import the Python module, and that uh, spits up a Python interpreter in the background. And then uh, th this is all Mojo code, where it's just using Mojo IO. And then I can do a Python command of add to path. I'm running a Python command of add examples to the path. I'm doing a Python import module. OK. So, so that, 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 that piece of Python code we just saw, it then opens up a Python interpreter and uh, adds that, that Python file to its uh, list of loaded modules and then runs it. So right now, the best practice is probably to do all your, uh, all your command line interface IO code in Mojo pass it into Mojo and then let Mojo execute it on your fancy numerical kernel that you're optimizing for your GPU or R or whatever. But, but just keep all of your, your string processing code in Python. <clears throat> and a couple things beyond Mojo that Mojo isn't picking up, but kind of is. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that Mojo and C++ are now fighting for is coming up with a way to lint which variables are low cardinality and which variables are constants, because nobody wants to actually specify that for every single variable. It'd be nice if the compiler was able to just profile your code and tell you what's constant and what's, uh, like it's only one or two different values, so I can turn that into an enum for lookup table or whatever. Uh, so that, that's something that's the next version of C++ and Mojo are probably going to be fighting on. And, I, and because of these advancements in Mojo, the C++ committee, from what I understand, is strongly talking about adding SIMD types to the next C++. And so competition is good. Um, this is a paper that actually came out, well, the code actually got tweeted uh, last night. And it's actually from China, which means that these guys are getting around the GPU ban by pretending that they're Japanese and just using GPUs in Tokyo. Uh, but they came out with a way to uh, speed up Lama.cpp. They're saying by 11x, which is huge. And the way that they're doing it is they have a, uh, oh, they, they forked Lama.cpp and then added a bunch of stuff. Where is it? Solver? Am I looking at the wrong? Now I'm confused. Did they, did they delete that last night? Interesting. But they have a solver in here that they're, they're calling out to that basically looks at all of the uh, all of the matrices that are passed in as the language model executes, it notices which neurons are usually set to zero and ignores all the weights around those. Well, sorry, it doesn't ignore those weights. It finds out which ones that are not zero with high probability and it caches those in GPU memory by pinning it. And so that, uh, according to them, can speed up your language inference by about 10 X if your entire uh, model doesn't fit into GPU RAM. And they're probably doing a second version of that in like fast GPU RAM. I'm not quite sure. But so yeah, that's, that's going to be a big thing moving forward is it, with all these machine learning clothes, uh, being able to profile which pieces of the, of the data are actually being used and to keep those in, in, in hot cache. The other thing 
that I haven't really seen anybody do. I don't know how how easy this is, but for the uh, the matrix weights that you're passing, how how well can you compress them with like GZIP or whatever? Um, because like on Unix we have ZRAM, uh, which uses like the ZSTD. <clears throat> what is it? It's a compression algorithm. And so there's also another thing that no one's really looked at before as to what uh, what algorithms can the GPU de decompress? And then using those to pass uh, easily decress decompressible things to the GPU to lower the amount of uh, bandwidth you have to send to the GPU. But he has passed them back. And, and also, if the GPU is able to compress things, it can hold more stuff in GPU memory, just like GRAM. But you have to do compression algorithms that target the GPU architecture because GPUs hate things like if statements. So that's like the, the, the kryptonite of GPUs. If it's an if statement, that's the stop the world. Usually, something like that, they. And Apple also came out with a paper and that you played last night. Can this operation also mean something with GPU flash takes more time than the speed up that you get? It would be a specific use case. Uh, you, yeah. Uh, but you'd want a uh, uh, compression protocol like what uh, Intel's IPP was, where it's super stupid fast. Yeah. But uh, you'd want the equivalency for a GPU. And, and I think that's kind of what some people are doing right now, where they're encoding floats as uh, as small, like four-bit integer values, hmm. and then they're, de de they're they're decoding them that way. But like, let's take like like this float number here, it's actually in 16 to 32 bits. We're just going to call it this small energy value. And then we're just going to pass these small energy values. We're going to expand it out to their actual float values before you pass in the matrix unit, which I think is the other way that, that people are doing compression right now. Um, and the other thing that we're going to see a big win on is this multi-level intermediate representation. The way that Christian Latner is using it for Mojo is very... I, I haven't actually seen the code, but it doesn't seem like he's doing that much with it. But I think we're also going to get MLIR passes for things like, hey, you are on a Linux system that has this uh, OS page size. We're going to tell you that your, uh, um, your caching level, <laughs> thinking like a caching topology for the, for the CPU, you're going to have all this information down in the compiler. And the, so the compiler is going to have much more visibility uh, as to what, like, like the scheduling book, this FFmpeg thing. That's going to be done at the compiler level for a lot of this. It's going to be fixed, fixed scheduling. Um, yeah, this MLIR is going to be very powerful as, as it starts to do more and more with IO level, levels, as opposed to just CPU uh, L1 stuff. Um, and the other thing that is going to be big, that uh, there's a guy who wrote a PhD thesis on this a couple of years ago, uh, Max Wilsley, and he has a Rust code called EGG, which is, stands for uh, e-graphs are good. And he wrote uh, what's called the quality saturation for all of your linear algebra. Uh, so, so, so for high school algebra, you know, you have all your algebra, like equality rules for like matching, like manipulating algebra equations. Um, you have your, actually, I remember a talk about this a long time ago, I can pull it up. But anyway, you take all your junior high algebra rules for whatever domain you're in, and you feed them to this e-graph thing, and it uses that to search for uh, um, all the different transformations you can do. And if you do this in the machine learning world, you can optimize your layout of your uh, machine learning graphs for, for all of your all of your matrix operations. And so he's, he's doing this a quality saturation to basically look at all the, the junior high algebra type rules, except for matrices, that you can apply to transform everything. And he's searching the entire state space. <laughs> Or the one that's fastest for your architecture, 
Um, and he was able to beat a lot of uh, like the PyTorch scheduler and stuff. And I think we're going to see more and more of those type of things where you're going to build up a, like a list of rules that you're allowed to, to transform things between, and the compiler just figures out which order to, to apply to. You're going to need to recompile for. Sorry, what? You're going to need to recompile for different brands of GPUs, right? So actually, I can pull up a. Well, after after we stop recording, but oh, actually, I can do it now. Um, so I have a pull request open. Okay. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm just going to go to there. So I, I have a pull request there more than this. But if we go to their tutorial, no, this is a test file. It's your math. That's it. Okay. So here's, he sets up, uh, this is in Rust. Um, but he sets up uh, all of your, 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 your junior high math operations. He gets yeah. your, well, Junior high in Russia because there's differentiation and in, in, in integration, which usually you don't see through calculus, which got your uh, add by divide power square root sine cosine. And then down here, he comes up with uh, matching rules where, uh, what is this? If I have A plus B, I can change that into B plus A. I forget what the name of that is. It's the calculus oh, over addition. And these are in the list notation where it's uh, the operation and then your two variables. And then here's the, the same thing for multiplication. He's got the associative property for addition. So if I take uh, B plus C and then I add that to A, uh, that's the same as if I swap it out to this equation. So this is basically your, it's, it's your junior high algebra rules. Well, it really is, Ex except it's it's applied to things that are more than just integers. Like it's it's modern it's junior high. Mm -hmm. And it, it just chases these equalities within the compiler to see which uh, which expansion of those um, is the fastest for your architecture experimentally. Yeah, that's Polish notation. Say what? Polish notation. Yeah, well, it's more less. Yeah. Nice. yeah. But um, yeah, a lot of the future of compiler development is just as simple as junior high algebra. And the only thing that, that's going to really trip your brain for about an hour until you understand it is that exponents are functions. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, of course, because it's multiplying something by itself. To see yeah, so, so if you have a... So not only would it be a function, but likely a recursive one. So if, if, I have a, if I have like two binary to the n, so all of your uh, binary strings of, of length n, it, it's basically a function from uh, all the ways that you can take n and, and map it to, to binary. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but anyway, exponentiation is functions. So that's the only thing that, that they didn't teach you in junior high algebra. Is addition, multiplication, that's all the same. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's the other thing that we're going to be seeing here very soon is a lot more equality saturation <laughs> stuff making its way into the compiler with SMP solvers. And there's a really great talk down here at the bottom. Oh, by the way, if you want these slides, they're at a. Uh, I've already. I, I did have. I already have. Okay. Yeah, they're they're already in the Zoom uh, chat. Okay. Um, th this is a really good uh, introductory talk by Chris Leitner at the LLVM Developers Conference, where they get into a lot more of the some of the lower level stuff. I I would highly recommend watching this if you want to program some Mojo. But, but that's enough mojo to be dangerous and maybe a little refresher on how C, C and Unix interop with a small program. But 
That's all I have. This we're getting something else. Uh, no, I mean we're at uh, eight, almost eight thirty. So I mean that that usually is our sweet point for the amount of chaos we can so so i'll go ahead and hit stop here on the recording and we can get into the lug unplug <clears throat> yeah.